So please get excited. Please throw show some energy. And I'd love to t take it over to the person who wrote the book on the data economy and data as an asset, Mr. Michael Clark himself. Thank you very much. Bear with my voice. I lost it about two days ago, so this is going to be good. Thank you very much. Okay, so... My God, it's really bad. I should do movies. Um, can I work here? Yeah, you use your laptop. Oh, okay, fine. I was thinking then. Okay, so the word asset came up in all my work four years ago. Um, and it's weird to call it an asset, but the single fact is, let's just get this out of the way early. Nobody understands data and no one appreciates it. If you start from that premise, you're in a really good place. And I'll explain why that is a true statement. So, and it seems an odd statement to make because we seem to be progressing nicely, right? If we look at the world today, growing digital payments, new forms of asset, even marketplaces and super apps exist, right? So life feels really good. If I look forward to the future, immersive commerce, all these new experiences powered by Web3, all these technologies are taking us to a place that we feel is better, right? But the reality is underpinning all that data itself has been on a journey, which I don't think many people realize. Um, we are made of data, right? That's what people sometimes forget. Um, the data in our body is about 13.6 billion years old. Um, the hydrogen in our body is as old as the universe. So we are a walking library of data, and that's how we started off. We started drawing on walls, they were cave paintings, they were a form of identity, they were a form of relationship. Fast forward to hieroglyphics, fast forward to the Rosetta Stone, these were all the foundations of language and world building. And then data became research. So then data was the foundation of computing, it was the foundation of AI and the foundation of virtual reality as we know it. But the big difference is data became a byproduct of a transaction. And that's when storage was created, and that's when mindless storage was created, where people were just storing stuff they didn't understand the value of what, it was just a necessary device to actually capture data. I think in the 1950s, someone wrote in to the New Statesman, maybe 1960s actually, I forget the date, but the comment was, what are we gonna do with all this data we're creating? It was the right and wrong question. If they'd have asked, where is the value in all this data we're creating, we'd have been on the right track. Then suddenly data became a commodity as part of the internet and the mobile generation. So data went from world building to research to commodity. So now data is being traded behind the scenes, the internet became the action-based economy, and on top of that then, data became everything. It's now connected to everything that we do every single day. It powers your mobile phone. Bring this into perspective. We create 1.7 meg every second. All of you are doing that right now on your mobile phones. So Heath, who was here the other day, he rightly debunked the IDC numbers. They're actually about 74,000 zettabits. Let's just bring this into the real world for you. Um, you know, if I lived, and if everybody in the world lived to be 90 years of age, which we hope everybody does, that kind of gets you that number. Um, if you want to bring that down another level, that's what that number means. Really, it's 65 million football stadiums worth of data with about 70,000 people in each one. That's how much data we will create, which is incredible, right? And this chart here is something produced by, the ID, uh, by SOMO, which is released every year. It gives you a sense of how much data is created every minute. Um, so the numbers say that we've created 90% of the world's last data in the two to four years. I'm sorry to tell you, 80% of the internet is duplicated. All right, so apparently we're progressing. The technology's progressing, our use of data is declining. And it's reflected in some of the statistics. Um, $30 billion is the value of our new software globally. Most companies have around about 367 systems on average, and their staff spend around two-thirds of their week or a third of their week trying to find data in the first place. 68% of data is used by businesses, not used. But storage prices are going up and costs. So we've kind of got this tension. And 97% of all health data is not used. Yet here I am in 2024, and not a single person has a view of their health in one place. And on top of that, trust is actually declining. So these are some of the things that you may not know. 
um, is that 16% of UK people can't find a balance on their bank statement at all. And this is the scary one, actually. Um, we now have the attention span of eight seconds. A goldfish has nine. Sorry. Um, also, interestingly, the last two years of cyber attacks were because of human error in industry and businesses, because we just don't know how to read data anymore, because we get too much of it and we can't understand it. And then that comes back to then trust. So 54% of Americans have absolutely no idea what a company does with their data. None at all. And then on top of that, you've got 76% um, people think sharing their data is a necessary evil. In doing my book, I interviewed a lot of students and they said to me, look, if we don't give up our data, we won't be able to connect with our friends on communities and connect. So it's a necessary evil to give up data. But what is data as well? It's actually a cultural artifact. If you think about it, 14 million people a year go and visit the pyramids in Egypt. Why? Because they want to know stories and memories of the past. Because that's actually what data is. It's a story, it's a memory, it's experience. It's our modern day cultural asset. That's what it's become. But sadly, we don't respect it. So between 1991 and 1995, the internet was never archived. So the early days of the internet, not much of it still exists. That's one fact. The other fact is platforms fail regularly, but data vanishes with the platform, just disappears. So Yahoo is an example, GeoCities is probably the worst case, um, where 12 years of data were completely deleted. Um, and on top of that, why am I showing the New York Library in the background? Because if you add up all the data that was deleted between 2009 and 2018, that's the equivalent of me standing in front of the New York Library with a big delete button and deleting the whole building. That's how much of our culture has been deleted in the last 10, 15 years. During COVID, the British archives struggled to piece together the history of COVID because data is constantly being recycled and misunderstood. Um, the irony is we've been here before. It's, what, it's the good thing about looking through history because you see parallels um, which other people do not. It's weird I'm going to talk about water. So in the early days of water, there was industrial pollution and there was also water scarcity. That was also addressed by the fact that, oops, we had technology at our disposal. We started to see early water treatment plants and we saw broader capabilities about managing and distributing water. But there was also policy breaches, water right conflicts, violations of regulation. And then on top of that then, there was a case for an asset because there was health risks and there was unfair equitable use of water. You can see where I'm going with this, right? Um, ooh, oil, interesting. So anybody knows your history, Standard Oil dominated the oil industry. Too big, monopoly, broken up, which is why you see all the oil companies that exist today, because they came from that moment. Oops, sorry. Computer says no. Dear me. Oh, seriously, MasterCard. All right, disregard. All right. Oh, seriously, you're gonna make me do this, you. All right, let me just get rid of this. There you go. Okay, fine. I can't see on screen, that's why. All right, leave it on big screen. Never mind, I'll leave, I'll leave the secret. So if you look here, you've got refinement capabilities, breaches in international trade, oil disputes. Now let's look at data. Data monopolies and consolidation of power, which is the equivalent of unregulated banking. Cloud computing, Web3, all of these technologies are now at my disposal that we've never had before in our lifetime. I have ethics failures, I have data privacy, and I have breaches. And the cause for an asset is antitrust and tech concerns. So actually, the environment is ripe. It's almost like a perfect storm that is recreating the basis underlying environment causes that created all the other assets. And by the way, it's the same for all of them. It's the same for gas, it's the same for all of them. They all had a combination of events over a period of time where just time made sense for it to happen. So if we want to move forward with humanity, that means we need a new mission. We need a whole new narrative to rethink data, which is this mission, which is putting the data in the services of humanity. 
giving everyone the human right to own, create, and understand the data that makes them who they are, whilst I, a, giving them the choice to share who they choose to share it with, the rewards they get, and having the transparency and control. That means you need a new vision, which ultimately says, we will transform data into an actual asset that is priced and valued. And I don't mean value financially, I mean valued as in appreciated as a national asset that's managed by a nation and managed by its people. Which means that means people are educated how to use it. Critical thinking, the ability to debate, the ability to reason with data, but also the reason to price data. This is what happens when data becomes an asset. It's not a digital representation. It becomes the foundations of a nation and its people. And then technology enables that. Which is why the word data as an asset is so powerful, because it's the only thing that's similar to water, which is data. The big difference is what makes data as an asset so powerful is it's infinite. All the other resources are finite. That's the big difference. Even when you look at money, what is money? It's an instrument of debt. Data is not. So it starts to open up a different mindset because for it to become an asset, data ownership also has to become law. Brazil is the first country in the world that I know of that is going to make it law that its citizens can monetize their own data. That law now is out for consultation, which means other countries around the world will follow and ownership will become a thing. So you've now cleared the first building block for data to become an asset because an asset must be owned by someone. So now it's owned. So it now has the underlying principles to be an asset. The other thing is I need to be able to rethink value, to value an asset in the first place because this is the biggest problem with data. I don't want to debunk on the data economy, but the data economy is actually a mirage because its value is the value of the market cap of the companies in the data economy, not the value of the data flowing through the economy. Because why? Because data at 1020 is very different to 1021 or 121 because I'm adding to it over time. So as a basket of data, it could be worth 10 times as much. But it's also everything and nothing at exactly the same time. If I put it in one environment, it's worth millions of dollars. The same data in another environment is completely worthless. So you have to understand the intrinsic and the extrinsic value of data, which means we need to rethink value itself when it comes to data. Because intrinsic value means, well, what does it mean to me? My cultural heritage of that data, how old is it? Its uniqueness. But as a business, I have a whole other set of intrinsic values which matter to me. But then there's also the extrinsic value when data gets valued to the outside world, when people consume it. So once you have value and you have ownership, you're on the journey for something to be an asset, which is what we're doing, or the endeavor. That sounded good. My movie voice. Um, but then this is where it's different. So we've seen countries around the world, even companies, try to reward people for sharing their data. But that's not good enough because we know that's not a one-off event. If I share my data with a company, they're probably going to use that to feed an AI model, and there's continual value that I'm not getting as a data owner. So we need to include continual streams of value because that's what data will bring. Again, the underlying basis of an asset. Different products will come off the back of it, which I include in the book, which is financial data assets. So data equity, find data equities, data bonds, data ETFs, data savings products will all become as a basis of this. AI will become modular as a consequence. Today, AI is too big, too many parameters, not enough data. Eventually, for it to run on the edge, we will need modular AI, but that means AI running on my own diverse data in real time. So that means I'll have health LLMs, I will have LLMs that just work on my data for specific domains of interest, running locally, knowing who I am. Because who I was yesterday is not who I am today. Part of the issue with AI. In China, they've reduced these down to about 6 billion parameters. I know people who are building them to 20 million. Uh, which means that in three years' time, there will be marketplaces of LLMs, which you will download locally to your device running on your data. So these are the use cases that you can start to see emerging as data itself becomes the asset of choice. I talked about this on the coin desk the other day, which was, you know, Porter asked me what some of the use cases are around data as an asset, and next generation scenario planning is the obvious one. 
I can take all my data and build a perspective. Um, so today, my data only knows my Amazon life, my Apple life, and my, all my viewing history, right? What if I could build all that into a single perspective and run it on my device? What if I could take all my career pockets and fragmentations and build a perspective of my career? All of that is actually possible if you focus on the data itself and connect it. Today, we have about 100 passwords between us because we allow data to be fragmented from identity, which is the real power of Web3, because then all of a sudden I, I, I complete the magic trident, right? Which is data, identity, and value. Once I connect the three, I now get connected data, which means that's even more valuable to big tech than they think, because now they have more data than they've ever seen before in their life. The reason I show this as scenario planning, because in the next, probably the next two years, I'm working with people now like Unity to make this possible, um, we'll create digital twins of our own data. So A-B testing at birth with our own data running with digital twin technology. Um, that might seem like make-believe, but why not? BMW has an entire factory all over the world that's managed by digital twins. Why can't I manage my own health data the same way? Where this really goes is I inherit all my data to my children, and they run it on their own device with AI to learn things about me. Maybe I was born with diabetes and they've got diabetes and they want to learn all the things I tried and then they can apply it to themselves with an AI to try new things maybe 10 years later. Yeah. Remember, it's 2024. We have, what, the most powerful computers in our pocket but we still don't have a single view of our health, which is what we can now have because we have the capability to do it. I drew this picture about six years ago. Um... Yeah, I think it is six years old now. Um, and it still holds true to this day. Is that data is at the heart of everything that we do and will ever do. One thing I'll ask you to take away is do not think of this as a transaction because it never was. And it never was a number. This thing built worlds and gave us language. And everything we do every day is a story and experience. Let me give you a true story just to really ground this. I caught a plane from London to Dubai and there was a lady opposite me and she wanted to talk to me. It's like one of these things on the plane. But she was sitting weirdly and she said, um, I started talking to her and I asked her, like, why are you lying like that? And she said, oh, I have back cancer. And uh, I was stage four. I broke my back in the gym and they found it. And then she cured herself after like a year and they didn't know how. And I asked her, well, what did you do? And she said, well, I can't remember... But people keep asking me what I did so I can help them. And I said, well, wouldn't it be cool if you owned your own data and we could go back 100 years and now we share value for value? Right? Imagine I've got cancer, she's got cancer. I'm following the medical advice. She's following a different model and we share data between us. And then I run AI on it. What could we do? That's what this really comes down to. I met a woman who told me a story and she can't share that with anyone. That's data. In fact, it's a form of information that's derived from data. That's why this stuff is so powerful in what you're doing. Because when it becomes an actual asset, and I don't mean a technical one, when it means it has the regulation wrapped around it, it is financially recognized, all of those things, by default you get transparency, by default you get all the things that we don't get today. And you give everybody a chance in the world to share their story. Because I guarantee you one thing, there is somebody on this planet who can't access a computer who has data we've never seen before in our life. If they could share it, they could solve a disease. We just don't know. If you look at this diagram, what you'll see is data will become the way we identify ourselves. It'll be the way we prove things. But it will also be the way that we build relationships. It will also be a store of value. So Porter says it's the next one, and I agree with him. Actually, if the two of them had a baby, Bitcoin and Ethereum, you'd get data because data is both of them. It's a store of value and a utility that's programmable. It's both of them, yeah? Um, on top of that, as we said, it's utility, it's the way we view ourselves, but also it's well-being. So we already saw data as telemedicine during COVID. That was a thing. Um, it's also synthetic. People do create unreal versions of data, which is fine for the specific use case. But also it'll be a mirror. I'll use data to solve problems on myself and A-B tests. So it's an asset class that will shape 
not just this generation, but the generations that follow. The goal is very simple. I would like a child to be born into data and not AI. Because if they're born into data, that means, do I use this publicly? Yeah, why not? Um, it means we'll remove the word artificial intelligence from all our conversation and we'll start talking about collaborative intelligence, which is actually human and machine working in partnership, running on their diverse data with children that can actually critically think, can debate, and can actually use and reason, and has data literacy. That's the vision. Because we'll empower them to lead with data. Because today it's just buried in databases, it's buried as transactions, we don't know what to do with it. Our storage is rising, compute is getting more, more expensive, energy demands are higher, yet we haven't got a clue what to do with it. If you make it an asset, it becomes part of the curriculum, but it also becomes part of everyday life properly. I always say this when I speak about data, is actually potential. It's potential to innovate, it's potential to solve problems, it's the potential to make change. Computing and technology just enables it and allows it to flow, which is why we can have this conversation today because all the amazing work you guys have done to make that possible. My job is to open the doors so technology can come in. And that's the work that I'm doing. And one thing I realized in writing the book is this is a really important statement is I, I can't change the rules of the game, but I can make data part of the game. Which means if I make it an asset, by definition, it's part of the game. I didn't change any rules. But the cool thing is all the rules that govern the game now apply to data, which means everybody wins. So I'll leave you with this. Um, all of you in this room and people who couldn't be here are all key to making this a reality. For the first time in probably our lifetime, we can have this conversation in this room because we now have the means. We have all the technology we will ever need. We'll have all the human capability that we'll ever need. Now we just need the will to make it possible, which is my ask of everyone in the room, is to actually make this real. Um, I suppose I better talk about a book, because why not? Um, he mentioned it. Um, so there's a book out next year. The book actually is in, I think it's at five parts. It's important to talk about the five. The first part is a voice for the next generation to demand change. This is effectively a story of data that you've probably not heard. I've given you snippets. The second part of the book is a guidebook for those that must change. So I'm actually going to show you how to make a data an asset legally, how to operate it with a framework that you guys can build against. I won't give you the technology, but I'll give you the building blocks and the functions and how it all works, and even how you value data itself. And then I'll give you all the use cases that you might want to think about across finance, health, longevity, communities, and so on, and a possible future, and an eight-point plan for every government in the world. Um, I'm working with governments globally to make it an asset possible, so all of you can make this a reality. So thank you very much. Do you, have, do you guys have questions? No. Oh, okay, good. I'll skip. No questions? Come on. Come on. I'll skip. Ty, go ahead. Uh, when you're talking to governments about data as an asset class, how much does tokenization of that data come into play in the blockchain side of ownership and uh, transparency? So, yes, that's part of the model. Um, the first thing is I have to meet them where they are. So to me, technology is like there. The first thing is I have to make them understand it's possible to make it an asset. So at a regulatory level, at an ownership level, then you can go down into the enablement part. Because I almost have to go into layers with them. First of all, I have to make it clear to them, like I've written to the UK government this morning, and the new science, the head of science and technology. Because you, you're hitting them first of all of, I think Porter said it, is the why first. Like as a country, Trust is the worst it's ever been when it comes to technology. So we're offering you a way out to say, look, if you recognize this as an asset, formally as a nation, you're going to get these seven things by design. Right? And when I'm in the room with them, which is the goal, then I can reveal the model itself and say, look, 
you have to have tokenization of data, you have to have a smart contract, you have to have blockchain, and you have to have some vehicle to access your data, right? Like a bank balance, like a portfolio of your value of your data. First of all, I have to create an environment that makes that possible. So I was involved in the UK when open banking was first created. So I, were, I helped a bank write a strategy on how they would compete. So the first thing is you have to create an environment so people can come in. So that's my first priority, but yes, absolutely. There are enablers, which I talk about in the book, which you've rightly described, and how that model actually works, and all the other functions. But before I get there, I say to the, I say to the, the government, well, who owns the asset? What does the asset do? Um, where can I use the asset? How do I value it? And then I get to how do I operate it, which is what you're describing. Um, but then there's another layer again beneath that, which says, well, how do I... Um, appreciate the asset, right? Because then you have to talk about education. Then you have to talk about cultural management of the asset, which is all the things I've had to write about and define. Because when I sit down with the government, I have to reach them there. Because the value for them is once it becomes an asset, you solve all the transparency issues with AI. Because now Google becomes a critical service provider like any other utility in the world, just by making it an asset. So if you start there, and you'll get to where you are when they start talking about enablement. And that's also why I'll probably go to countries which are already on that journey, because it's an easier sell, right? It's not always the problem, because you'll go to some countries and go, well, look, you don't need the model. Just apply these regulatory principles and build from there. Whereas I could go to Estonia, which is like a massive blockchain country, already has some of the infrastructure, we might just need to change regulation. So it really depends. But I, I always try and start with the why first and give them the outcomes. The next level then is exactly what you said, and that's what's in the book. Yes? You talked a lot about assets that have value or are valuable, but there is a lot of data on the internet that is the opposite of valuable, misinformation, disinformation. What role do you see that data playing in the data So I, I've got in the book agents that do that, because um, you also need to rate data. So to your point, you'll have different data, but I need to know what data of what rating to use in what conditions, uh, for what purpose. So an example would be, I get data from somewhere, and I want to use it to make a decision at a governmental level or something critical, I'm probably going to want a highly rated set of data that I can trace its source. So you need something like that. And then you're going to need to be able to validate the data to make sure it's real along with a rating, and then I need something to clean it and verify it and get rid of all the bias. So all of these agents and things I've built into the book as modules, as well as other services and plugins that you need to cleanse the environment, basically. Um, you'll see businesses emerge that do this, um, but they won't be run by people, they'll be run by AI agents probably, and something overseeing them that actually makes sure the rules applied by governments and you, another part of looking after the economy, will actually manage that and oversee it. That's why you do this one piece at a time. That's why if you start with the regulation and get people to buy into it and then be the messenger for it, you can then tackle that over time. Um, but it's not, a, you know, it's probably about one year to change a law and about t a decade to change a mindset. The goal is to get these things done incrementally so we can open the jaw to technologies to make this easier and this becomes possible. Yes, yeah, so it is a pain. Um, it's even harder when you're a big bag, I get to work with big corporations all the time. I met a bank last week, 75 years worth of data, right? Don't even know where the value is, so it's hard. That's why we talk about incrementally, one use case at a time, one intent at a time, breaks down the data silo. Um, but it will come. And we, we talk about stuff in the book and frameworks. Vision is beautiful, it's very you know, um, uh, inspiring, but let's say we all agree on okay, let's move to that tomorrow. What is the practical steps to do? Do I need to wear this massive device that you know, collects every data that is again collected by a centralized entity like 
what is the low hanging fruit that I could see tomorrow if I opt in? Be like, okay, now all my data is on Facebook, Amazon, or another centralized uh, entity. If I opt in tomorrow, what is the lowest hanging fruit that I can see? Be like, okay, take my money, let's do that. I think the lower hanging fruit is your personal data. That's the easy stuff, right? That's like the 10 or 11 data points that define you as a login. That's the easy one. And then you would then, I talk about this in the book, you can tokenize those whenever you sign up to a service. And it's not really about monetizing your data, so I wouldn't get fixated on that. It's certainly part of it. The question is, how can you turn your data into utility for yourself? Yeah? Because if you think about monetization, that's why ownership has failed constantly because whenever they go to big tech, there's, nothing, there's no law to change their mind, which is what I go back to, you can't change the rules of the game. And if you go after them with money, they will say to you, well, no, you can't have it. Whereas if you say, well, actually, I'll sign up to your service, and I'm having this data that's mine, anything related to that, I might choose. So LinkedIn would be a good example. You sign up for LinkedIn, you log in, you tokenize all your information, and you choose then the different types of information that are generated on LinkedIn that you would like to keep versions of, or have access to, to do what you want. That allows you to build your perspective on data, and who knows, you could build a perspective and then you could sell, or people could even invest in you as part of your data. But personal data is the easiest place to start for a regulator, because it's already defined and it's all standard. But the starting point before it gets to you, because to be frank, how we use data today isn't up to us, right? It's defined by enablers who then determine what a business can and cannot do. So that's why I have to go there, so then whatever you want actually becomes possible. And then the low-hanging fruit becomes the use cases that we all come up with. Yeah? So I have to start at, do we all agree that people should own their data? Yes. Okay, cool. Um, do we have a digital identity that correlates between data and identity? Yes. Okay, good. Let's start there. And then it becomes an asset by definition. And there are building blocks then that define an asset so it can be financially measured, all of that stuff that makes it compliant that then have to be done. But as that's happening, you could easily see startups trying new things in different spaces. Um, once an asset becomes an asset, it'll be like open banking. New companies will emerge, but the differences with open banking is those companies now will have to think about a value exchange for you to want to share with them. Yeah, yeah, so in the book, yeah, yeah, no, so in the book we talk about personal AI running on your device. That will do it for you, right? Um, but also you don't want data, I want information. Right, because data on its own is completely worthless. It's only when it's turned into value does it mean something. So you need capabilities on your super wallet to be able to do that for you, to translate it into, because you're sharing information with people. I don't need to know the markers and everything. I, I need the data, but something will turn it into insight and information for me. So you need that translation layer, which is why I had to put it in the book. Which is, I need a layer which captures raw data, someone stores it for me, not a centralized body in a decentralized network, and then basically someone says, okay, I want to do something with it, I will now turn it into value, and then move it. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. In the example you gave is just the base level if you follow the pyramid of data to wisdom, that's just the base level, no meaning, just a raw data dump. I'm going to turn it into something and then I'm going to issue an intent and I'm going to move it like a limit order on a stock market. That's what I'm going to do. All right. Let's give it up for Michael.